good afternoon all hope that all of you are staying safe and also staying uh, academically bright and proactive uh, we have finished the anatomy of the central nervous system and are moving on to the, uh, the anatomy of the abdomen and the pelvic regions so from uh, tomorrow onwards you will be having a series of lectures on the gross anatomy of abdomen and along with that i will be taking a few uh, classes on the development of the gastrointestinal tract because uh, this is a relatively important and uh, extensive topic I have divided it into uh, two or three uh, small modules, so that will be convenient for you to uh, study and uh, revise. So, uh, in today's class, we will be seeing uh, the first module of the development of the gastrointestinal tract or the development of the digestive system. As you know, uh, the uh, gastrointestinal tract or the uh, human digestive system consists of the esophagus stomach the small and the large intestines the small intestine uh, consists of three parts namely the duodenum jejunum and the ileum whereas the large intestine comprises of the uh, cecum and the appendix ascending colon the transverse colon, descending colon, and the rectum. You also see the, the uh, major digestive glands which are associated with the uh, gastrointestinal tract, namely the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. In the uh, series of classes on the gross anatomy of the abdomen, you will be studying in detail about all of this organs these are the specific learning objectives of uh, the first module on the development of the gastrointestinal tract first we'll seeing about the primitive gut tube and its uh, divisions we'll also be seeing about the development of the various peritoneal folds which are uh, associated with the GIT, the arteries that supply the gut tube. And uh, then uh, we'll be going to the derivatives of the foregut. And uh, lastly, we'll see about the development of the esophagus and the associated clinical correlates. Let's have a small recap. Uh, of the third week of development before we move further. You already stated that the cells of the epiblast migrate towards the primitive streak and uh, uh, upon arrival in the region of the primitive streak, they become flask shaped, detach from the epiblast and slip beneath the epiblast. And this process is known as invagination. And uh, once these cells uh, have started invagination, some of these cells, they displace the hyperblast, creating the embryonic endoderm, which is the first uh, definitive germ layer to be formed. Whereas uh, other group of cells come to lie between the epiblast and newly created endoderm to form the intraembryonic mesoderm. And lastly, the cells remaining in the epiblast uh, forms the uh, ectoderm. Thus, the epiblast through the course of gastrulation is the source of all the germ layers uh, of the uh, embryo and cells in these la layers will give rise to all the tissues and organs in the embryo. Now, uh, the endoderm is very important uh, from the viewpoint of the development of the uh, gastrointestinal tract because it is a, that the endoderm that gives rise to the various structures related to the gastrointestinal system. So, with these ideas, uh, we will start uh, with the development of the gastrointestinal tract.
the first structure we are going to see is called as the primitive gut it's also called as the gut tube another event which happens during the later part of the third week of development is the folding of the embryonic disc there occurs a cephalocaudal as well as a lateral folding of the embryo a cephalocaudal and lateral folding of the embryo so what happens is that as a result of this uh, cephalocaudal and lateral folding of the embryonic disc a portion of this endoderm derived from the gastrulation is incorporated into the embryo to form the primitive gut so as a result of the cephalocaudal and lateral folding of the embryo a part of the endoderm is incorporated into the embryo to form an endodermal lined tube which is called as the primitive gut whereas uh, two other parts of this endoderm lined cavity namely the yolk sac and allantois they lie outside their embryo in the last slide we have seen the formation of the the primitive gut and now uh, in this slide we will uh, try to understand the subdivisions of the primitive gut as uh, you can see in this picture the cephalic and the caudal parts of the primitive gut forms blind ending tubes that it becomes uh, it uh, ends blindly in the cephalic and caudal parts of the embryo so these are called the cephalic part of the primitive gut is called as the foregut whereas the caudal part of the primitive gut is termed as the hindgut the part in between the foregut and the hindgut is called as the midgut it remains connected to the yolk sac by means of a structure called as the vitelline duct or the vitello intestinal duct so uh, you can understand there are three divisions of the primitive gut namely the foregut midgut and the hindgut the midgut is important in regard that it remains temporarily connected to the yolk sac by means of the vitelline duct or the vitello intestinal duct although we speak about the three major divisions of the primitive gut namely the uh, foregut midgut and the hindgut the uh, development of the primitive gut and its derivatives is usually uh, uh, discussed related to four parts that i will uh, try to make it clear the uh, cranial most part of the foregut is termed as the pharyngeal gut the cranial most part of the foregut is called as the pharyngeal gut so now uh, we can see there are four divisions of the primitive gut uh, in a cranio caudal sequence these are the pharyngeal gut the foregut midgut and the hindgut and now uh, we will see uh, what is the uh, extension of each of these parts and uh, this is important uh, because uh, this gives you a uh, clue regarding the uh, different structures uh, derived uh, from these particular parts the first part that the pharyngeal gut extends from the buccopharyngeal membrane the buccopharyngeal membrane uh, is a uh, primordium of the future mouth so the pharyngeal gut extends from the buccopharyngeal membrane to the uh, tracheobronchial bud uh, that means uh, the uh, uh, the respiratory diverticulum which gives rise to the uh, the trachea and the lungs the uh, next part that is the foregut extends from the respiratory diverticulum or the tracheobronchial 
but to the liver outgrowth or the liver but which gives rise to the liver the midgut extends from the liver but to the junction of the right two third and left one third of the transverse colon and the hindgut extends from the left one third of the transverse colon to the cloacal membrane so uh, to recap the development of the primitive gut and its various derivatives is usually discussed in four sections the first section is called as the pharyngeal gut which extends from the bucco pharyngeal membrane or the mouth to the uh, the respiratory diverticulum or the tracheobronchial bud the second part fore gut extends from the respiratory diverticulum or the tracheobronchial bud to the liver bud the third part namely the mid gut extends from the liver bud up to the junction of the right two thirds and left one third of the transverse colon and whereas the hind gut extends from the left one third of the transverse colon to the uh, cloacal membrane uh, in our further discussion we will not be considering the derivatives of the pharyngeal gut because this you have already seen uh, uh, in the development of the head and neck region and you have already studied that the pharyngeal arches they form in this part of the pharyngeal gut in our uh, discussion on the development of the gastrointestinal tract we'll be focusing mainly on the derivatives of the foregut the midgut and the hindgut we have already seen that uh, it is a endoderm uh, that gives rise to the the major part of the uh, the primitive gut and later on the uh, structures of the gastro intestinal tract in the adult in fact this endoderm gives rise to the entire epithelial lining of the digestive tract it also forms the parenchyma of the various glands which are associated with the git like the liver and the pancreas but the uh, you should know that the uh, gastrointestinal tract is not entirely derived from endoderm there is a contribution from the mesoderm also it is a visceral mesoderm or it is a splanchno pleuric mesoderm uh, that gives rise to the muscle the connective tissue and the peritoneal components of the gut wall and this visceral mesoderm again forms the the stroma of the glands you should uh, remember that the endoderm forms the epithelial lining of the entire uh, digestive tract or the gastrointestinal tract and it also forms the parenchyma of the various glands like the liver and the pancreas before we go to the uh, derivatives of each part of the primitive gut uh, we will try to see something uh, about the peritoneum and the uh, peritoneal folds related to the uh, the abdominal organs as you will be studying uh, soon the peritoneum is a large thin serous membrane that lines the interior of the abdominal pelvic cavity so it's a uh, thin serous membrane that lines the interior of the abdominal pelvic cavity it's made up of a tough layer of elastic tissue aligned with a uh, simple squamous epithelium and uh, uh, it forms the largest serous sac of the body the peritoneum is similar to the pleura and the serous pericardium uh, that uh, you already uh, studied uh, in that it consists of two layers a parietal and visceral layers and these two layers are separated from each other uh, by a potential space called as the peritoneal cavity which is filled with a thin uh, capillary film of peritoneal fluid the mobile parts that is the most mobile parts of the intra abdominal digestive tube 
are completely surrounded by the visceral layer of the peritoneum except for a small area where it passes from this tube to the posterior abdominal wall as a double layered fold called as mesentery. As I have already told you, the peritoneum presents two layers, a parietal peritoneum and visceral peritoneum. The parietal peritoneum is a simple layer that lines the internal surface of the abdominopelvic walls, whereas the arrangement of the visceral layers is somewhat complex. Uh, it forms folds which surround the intricately folded and tightly packed uh, gut tube. The detailed uh, anatomy of the peritoneum and the, uh, the uh, layers and the various peritoneal folds uh, you will be uh, uh, studying in your uh, gross anatomy lectures on the uh, peritoneum. We have seen in the last slide that uh, the mesentery is defined as a double layer of peritoneum uh, that encloses an abdominal uh, viscera or organ and suspends it from the uh, posterior abdominal wall. Many organs uh, uh, within the abdomen are suspended by the peritoneal folds and these organs are uh, very much mobile within the abdominal cavity. So apart from allowing mobility to these organs, the peritoneal folds also provide uh, pathways for the passage to nerves, vessels and lymphatics uh, to reach these organs uh, uh, from the posterior abdominal wall. So these organs uh, which are uh, completely covered by the peritoneum are referred to as intraperitoneal organs. What do you mean by the retroperitoneal organs? The organs that lie outside the peritoneal cavity uh, are called as the uh, retroperitoneal organs. The retroperitoneal organs are usually fixed to the posterior abdominal wall and therefore immobile. There are two types of retroperitoneal organs, primarily retroperitoneal and secondarily retroperitoneal. Primarily retroperitoneal means these organs, uh, for example, like the kidneys, suprarenal glands and the ureters are originally seen outside the, uh, the peritoneal cavity. Whereas some organs uh, are initially suspended by the peritoneal folds, that is they possess uh, some kind of mesenteries but later on lose their mesenteries uh, and become retroperitoneal. So these organs are referred to as the secondary retroperitoneal. That is initially they have got a mesentery uh, which is later on lost. Examples of a secondary retroperitoneal organs are the pancreas, uh, the duodenum and the various parts of the, the large intestine like the ascending colon, descending colon and the cecum. Uh, the details uh, of the intraperitoneal and retroperitoneal organs again uh, you will be uh, seeing in detail along with the gross anatomy of the peritoneum. Now we will see something about the development of the, the various mesenteries uh, which are related to the uh, gastrointestinal tract. So uh, during uh, the initial uh, phases of development the portions of the gut tube uh, and uh, its uh, various derivatives are suspended from the dorsal and the ventral body wall by double layers of peritoneum. These are referred to as the mesenteries. So the uh, parts of the gut tube and its derivatives are suspended from the uh, dorsal as well as the ventral body wall by double layers of peritoneum uh, which are called as the, the mesenteries. So here you can see two types of mesentery uh, during the uh, development. It's the ventral mesentery and the dorsal mesentery. The ventral mesentery uh, suspends uh, the gut tube and its derivatives to the anterior abdominal wall, whereas the dorsal mesentery uh, suspends the uh, parts of the gut tube and its derivatives to the posterior abdominal wall. First, we will take up the dorsal mesentery. Uh, as you already seen, uh, the dorsal mesentery can be defined as a double layered fold of peritoneum that attaches the, uh, the developing gut tube and its derivatives to the dorsal body wall or the uh, posterior uh, body wall. 
Initially, if you see, uh, the foregut, midgut, and the hindgut are in broad contact with the posterior abdominal wall. What happens by the fifth week is that uh, this uh, connecting tissue bridge has narrowed down and uh, the caudal part of the foregut, the midgut and a major part of the hindgut are suspended from the uh, posterior abdominal wall by this dorsal mesentery. So by about the uh, uh, fifth week, uh, this dorsal mesentery has narrowed down to the region extending from the caudal part of the foregut, the midgut and the major part of the hindgut. So, uh, if you see in the abdomen, this dorsal masonry extends from the lower part of the esophagus to the rectum as a continuous sheet of tissue attached to the posterior body wall and providing a pathway for the blood vessels, lymphatics and nerves to the gut tube and its derivatives. And uh, the various regions of this dorsal masonry are named according to the parts of the gut tube to which they are attached. So, the dorsal uh, various parts of the dorsal mesentery or the various regions of the dorsal mesentery they are named according to the parts of the gut tube to which they are attached that we will see in the uh, next slide here we will see the important derivatives or regions of the dorsal mesentery as i have already uh, told you the uh, parts of the dorsal mesentery are named uh, according to the parts of the gut tube to which uh, they are attached. So, if you see in the region of the stomach, the part of the dorsal mesentery that attaches the stomach to the, uh, the posterior abdominal wall is termed as the dorsal mesogastrium. So, in the region of the stomach, it is a dorsal mesogastrium. Similarly, in the region of the duodenum, the part of the dorsal mesentery that attaches the duodenum to the posterior abdominal wall is termed as dorsal mesoduodenum. Dorsal mesoduodenum. The part of the dorsal mesentery that attaches the colon to the posterior abdominal wall is termed as the dorsal mesocolon. And uh, the uh, part of the uh, dorsal mesentery that attaches the most mobile parts of the small intestine, namely the jejunum and ileum, to the posterior abdominal wall is termed as the mesentery proper. There may be other types like the uh, um, dorsal mesentery that attaches the sigmoid colon to the posterior abdominal wall is called as the mesosigmoid that attaches the rectum to the posterior abdominal wall is called as a mesorectum that attaches the appendix to the posterior abdominal wall is called as a meso appendix and uh, so on. So, uh, once again, uh, we will try to see the important regions or the important derivatives of the dorsal mesentery. In the region of the stomach, it is the dorsal mesogastrium. Uh, in the region of the duodenum, it is termed as the dorsal mesoduodenum. In the colon, it is termed as the dorsal mesocolon. And uh, in the case of the jejunum and ileum, the term they are the dorsal mesentery, that part of the dorsal mesentery is termed as the mesentery proper. The further development of these uh, subdivisions of the dorsal mesentery uh, we will take up in the uh, uh, subsequent uh, slides. Now we will see something about the ventral mesentery. When compared to the uh, dorsal mesentery, uh, the ventral uh, mesentery or the attachment of the ventral mesentery is uh, somewhat narrow. It is present only in the region extending from the terminal part of the esophagus, the stomach and the upper part of the duodenum. So, uh, when compared to the dorsal mesentery, the ventral mesentery has got a narrow attachment uh, to the gut tube extending from the terminal part of the esophagus, the stomach to the upper part of the duodenum. And uh, this uh, ventral mesentery is derived from the mesenchyme of a structure which is called as a septum transversum. This ventral mesentery uh, is developed from a structure which is called as the septum transversum. Now we will see the derivatives of the ventral mesentery. The growth of the liver into the septum transversum divides the ventral mesentery into two parts. So the uh, liver actually grows 
between the the primitive gut and the anterior abdominal wall and this uh, developing liver divides the ventral mesentery into two parts the part of the ventral mesentery that extends from the lower part of the esophagus stomach and upper part of the duodenum to the liver it is termed as the lesser omentum whereas the part of the ventral mesentery that extends between the liver and the ventral body wall or the anterior body wall is termed as the falciform ligament so the growth of the liver into the septum transversum divides the ventral mesentery into two parts the part of the ventral mesentery which extends from the lower part of the esophagus stomach and upper part of the duodenum to the liver is termed as the lesser omentum whereas the part of the ventral mesentery that extends from the liver to the uh, ventral body wall or the anterior abdominal wall is termed as the falciform ligament now we'll see about the arteries of the developing uh, gut tube we already seen that the primitive gut or the gut tube is divided into the three parts namely foregut midgut and hindgut and it's important to uh, understand that uh, each of these divisions it's supplied by an artery it's actually each part it's supplied by an uh, ventral branch coming from the abdominal aorta so uh, each of the three parts the foregut midgut and the hindgut it's supplied by a ventral branch coming from the abdominal aorta now we'll see what are these arteries the artery of the foregut is called as celiac trunk uh, as you can see in the picture the celiac trunk or the celiac artery is the first ventral branch from the abdominal aorta the artery of the midgut is the superior mesenteric artery and the artery of the hindgut is the inferior mesenteric artery so these three uh, ventral branches from the abdominal aorta supply the uh, the three parts or the three regions of the primitive gut and uh, uh, we will see later that uh, this uh, different uh, divisions of the primitive gut will give rise to uh, specific uh, organs uh, of the gastrointestinal tract and whatever organs which are derived from each of these parts will be supplied by the branches from the corresponding artery so any uh, viscera or any organ which is uh, developed from the foregut uh, will be supplied either directly by the celiac trunk or by a branch from the celiac trunk so uh, the regarding the blood supply of this uh, abdominal viscera these uh, arteries are rather important so once again celiac trunk is the artery of the foregut superior mesenteric artery is the artery of the midgut and inferior mesenteric artery is the artery of the hindgut now we will see uh, each division of the uh, primitive gut and uh, try to understand uh, what are the different uh, viscera developed from uh, each of these parts first we will take up the foregut these are the derivatives of the foregut mouth and pharynx esophagus stomach duodenum the first part and the second part up to the opening of the bile duct and the uh, major digestive glands the liver and the pancreas here one important thing uh, is to note the development of duodenum the uh, you know the duodenum is divided into four parts uh, the first part and the second part up to the opening of the uh, bile duct is derived from the foregut whereas the rest of the duodenum is derived from the uh, midgut so duodenum has got a double uh, origin uh, one half is from the foregut and the other half is from the uh, midgut so naturally uh, when you take the arterial supply of the duodenum the part of the duodenum which is derived from the foregut it's supplied by the celiac trunk which is the artery of the foregut whereas the second half of the duodenum which is derived from the midgut 
it's supplied by the branches of the superior mesenteric artery which is the artery of the uh, mid gut the all other uh, structures like is uh, organs which are derived from the foregut are naturally supplied by either by the directly by the celiac trunk or by the branches of the celiac trunk we will see what happens to the foregut uh, during the early stages of development when the embryo is approximately uh, four weeks old the respiratory diverticulum also called as the lung bud appears in the ventral wall of the foregut at the almost at the border with the uh, the pharyngeal gut a septum called as the tracheoesophageal septum gradually partitions or separates this diverticulum from the dorsal part of the foregut so uh, the respiratory diverticulum or the lung bud which appears on the ventral wall of the foregut uh, at the border with the pharyngeal gut and uh, there is a development of the tracheoesophageal septum which gradually partitions or separates this respiratory diverticulum or the lung bud from the dorsal part of the foregut in this manner the foregut ultimately divides into two parts a ventral portion which forms the respiratory primordium and a dorsal portion uh, which forms the esophagus so uh, you can say that the tracheoesophageal septum divides the uh, the foregut into a ventral part which later on forms the uh, the respiratory system and is termed as the respiratory primordium whereas the dorsal part which uh, develops into the esophagus we will see the development of the esophagus in short as i already seen uh, the esophagus is developed from the dorsal portion or the dorsal part of the uh, the foregut at first the esophagus is uh, rather short but uh, with the descent of the heart and the lungs it lengthens rapidly the muscular coat of the esophagus which is formed by the surrounding uh, visceral uh, mesoderm is striated in its upper two thirds and is innervated by the vagus nerve whereas the muscle coat is smooth in the lower one third and is innervated by the, the splanchanic plexus we will see some of the important uh, congenital anomalies associated with the development of esophagus the most important uh, congenital anomaly of esophagus is termed as esophageal atresia or tracheoesophageal fistula this condition results uh, either from the spontaneous posterior deviation of the tracheoesophageal septum or uh, some other uh, mechanical factor pushing the dorsal wall of the foregut anteriorly so what happens here is that the proximal part of the esophagus usually ends as a blind sac and its distal part is connected to a trachea by a narrow canal just above the uh, bifurcation so this condition is called as esophageal atresia or tracheoesophageal fistula a atresia of the esophagus uh, usually prevents the normal passage of the amniotic fluid into the intestinal uh, tract resulting in accumulation of excess fluid in the amniotic sac a condition uh, which is called as polyhydramnios in uh, addition to the atresia uh, sometimes the lumen of the esophagus uh, may become narrow uh, causing uh, what is called as an esophageal stenosis usually uh, this takes place in the lower part of the esophagus and one more important uh, congenital anomaly associated with the development of uh, esophagus is that uh the in some uh, infants the esophagus fails to lengthen sufficiently and the stomach is pulled up into the esophageal hiatus through the uh, the diaphragm this condition is called as a congenital hiatal hernia so uh, the three common conditions associated with the uh, uh development of esophagus are esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula esophageal stenosis and congenital hiatal hernia.
we have come to the end of the uh, first module in the development of uh, gastrointestinal tract so let us revise uh, what are the important uh, points uh, that you have seen uh, in this session first we have seen about the uh, formation of the primitive gut tube then uh, what are the divisions and uh, we also seen the arteries that supply the divisions of the primitive gut tube we have also seen uh, the mesenteries associated with the uh, developing gut tube and uh, we have seen uh, the derivatives of the foregut uh, and also the development of the esophagus in brief and uh, we have seen some of the important uh, uh, congenital anomalies of uh, the development of the esophagus especially the tracheoesophageal fistula uh, in the next class we will try to see the uh, development of the rest of the organs mm, from the uh, foregut. Thank you.